and welcome everybody. My name is Marty Mascari. I am with the North Central Texas Area Agency on Aging and the North Central Texas Aging and Disability Resource Center, or ADRC, both of which are under the, North, under the umbrella of the North Central Texas Council of Governments in the greater Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area. Um, we are blessed here today to have our partners at the Better Business Bureau Education Foundation of Houston, um, Angels with us, and my cohorts, Melinda Gardner and Felicia Warner, who both also are with the Area Agency on Aging. Um, we're here to talk about complaints, grievances, beneficiary, I can't, it's it, I'm sorry, <laughs> and how to read your Medicare summary notice. Um, but if you can advance the slide one, before we get started, we're going to talk about CEUs. There you go. Thank you. For those of you that are joining us looking for CEUs or a certificate of attendance, um, the guidelines are the same for both. Um, we are offering CEUs today for licensed social workers and licensed professional counselors in the state of Texas. Um, that is what we're set up to provide CEUs for. If you have a different license in Texas or you have a license outside of Texas, you're more than welcome to go through the process, get a certificate, and um, submit it to the jurisdiction uh, for your licensing. But just note that there's no guarantee that they will take it, and uh, there's nothing I can do about that. Uh, we are only set up for the two licenses in Texas. Um, for joining us today, um, you, you can uh, earn an hour and a half CE credits. Um, you must complete the entire live webinar, and we don't do partial credits. You must also complete the Google Evaluation Survey form. This should pop up or give you the opportunity to go to it, to access it as you close out of Zoom today. If it doesn't, no worries. Um, I, know, I realize some companies have pop-up blockers that won't allow that. Um, I will be sending that out in um, a, second, uh, a first follow-up email um, that will probably go out tomorrow. Um, the Google survey will be alive and available uh, until 4.17, a week from today. So you must complete it by 5 p.m. next Monday. And um, give me about three weeks after that to get all the certificates out to you all. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to Felicia, who's actually gonna get us started. Good morning, Marty. Good morning, Melinda. Hi, Angel. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope everyone had a wonderful Easter holiday. And I was uh, laughing with Marty and Melinda and Angel about taking pictures in the blue bonnets. My lovely family would not uh, cooperate. They whined about snakes and ants. So anyway, uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Felicia. I'm with the Area Agency on Aging. It's a program of the North Central Texas Council of Governments. We are known as SHIP, which I'll explain shortly, but we also partner with the Texas Senior Medicare Patrol to provide information on fraud and abuse. And we are co-presenting uh, today with Angel, who will share information. So SHIP's are federally funded. The SHIP program was established by Congress and their work is funded by the U.S. Administration for Community Living at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. There are 54 SHIPs grantees, one in every 50 states, including Puerto Rico, Guam, the District of Columbia, and the Virgin Islands, which I really want to go to. The SHIP services are delivered by the state units on aging or the State Department of Insurance in partnership with their local area agencies on aging and other community-based partners. Nationally, uh, SHIP oversees a network of more than 2,000 local sites and over 12,000 team members, including staff and in-kind professionals and volunteers. In addition to SHIP services, many grantees provide senior Medicare patrol services, which help Medicare beneficiaries 
protect, detect, and report healthcare fraud and errors and abuse. Uh, SHIP recruits and trains both volunteers and in-kind team members to provide services SHIP, is, uh, SHIP team members are highly trained and certified to assist people in obtaining coverage through options such as original Medicare Parts A and B, Medicare Advantage, which is known by Part C, Medicare Prescription Drug Plan coverage, which is Part D, and the Medicare Supplement, which is Medigap. SHIP also assists beneficiaries with limited income, and it's very important for them to know that there are programs such as Medicaid, the Medicare Savings Program, and the extra help and low income subsidy that can help reduce their health care costs. SHIP conducts outreach by providing pre presentations, distributing information, conducting enrollment, enrollment events, and participating in health fairs and senior fairs and other community events. SHIP outreach helps us uh, to inform groups and individuals about the Medicare benefits, the coverage rules which change and written notices and forms and appeals and rights and procedures and more. Uh, and the most recent data shows that SHIP has provided one-on-one -on -one health insurance counseling to more than 2 million Medicare beneficiaries and their families and caregivers, over 330,000 adults under 65 with disabilities, outreach to 4 million individuals at public presentation, enrollment events, health fairs, senior fairs, and other community events. So we'll move on. Uh, SHIP can help you. Uh, the ACL manages the state health insurance assistance programs or SHIP and provides, which we are proud to say, unbiased help to Medicare beneficiaries, their families, and their caregivers. And so we'll go to the next slide. And SHIP uh, TA Center serves as a central source of information, expertise, and technical assistance for grantees. The TA Center disseminates knowledge and best practices through the development of new products and tools and provides one-on-one -on -one assistance to the network. So we'll go to the next one. And this is the volunteer. I started as a volunteer, so I'm really proud of this. So if you play that volunteer with SHIP. It's not playing, so we'll just move forward from that. I'm sorry, Melinda. It's it's not um, playing, so we'll just go to the, if you want to explain the volunteer, and then yes. we'll go to the next one. The volunteer opportunities, you can uh, complete. Uh, we start you out with uh, the Senior Medicare Patrol Program. And then you can gradually go into, or you can, at, in some cases, uh, do the, uh, the benefits counseling at the same time. But it's all online and you make application and it's just a real short application and uh, your ID and that type of thing. So you can volunteer uh, and you'll get the training. And I'm, I can tell you, you will enjoy the training and it's a lot of information, how you can help people in your community, in your church, and even your family, you might be able to help that auntie understand that the Medicare uh, pro, uh, plan that someone came by the house and sold her is not any good. So it's, it's a, a great deal of information that you can give to your, give back to your community. And that's one of the things I really enjoyed was helping individuals pick out uh, a plan. Of course, we provide unbiased information um, and help them 
understand what their options are with original Medicare, uh, Medicare Advantage plans, the uh, prescription drug plan, the Medigap uh, uh, plans, and, uh, and just a whole variety of things and grievances, which we will talk about today, and um, appeals. Okay, so we're at the Medicare Complaints, Grievances, and Beneficiary Resources. So we'll go into detail about complaints and grievances and uh, resources. And these are our objectives today during this Medicare Monday. We want to understand what is a complaint, understand what is a grievance, and a beneficiary resources. What is considered a Medicare grievance? A grievance is an expression of dissatisfaction with any aspect of the operations, activities, or behaviors of a Medicare health plan or its providers, regardless of whether action is required. And remember, the enrollee must file the grievance either verbally or in writing no later than 60 days after the event of or the incident causing the grievance. A grievance is a formal complaint, and you can file that with your Medicare Advantage plan or your prescription drug plan, or you, if you are dissatisfied with your plan for any reason, you can choose to file a, uh, a grievance. And an appeal is a request for your plan to cover a service or a item that has been denied. So a grievance is not an appeal. So if you, if you want, if you wish to file an agree, a grievance, your plan, and these are some of the examples, your plan fails to return a coverage determination, the plan fails to expedite a coverage determination, you experience poor quality at your doctor's office, at your in-network provider, you experience poor customer service from your plan representative, or you are told to pay an incorrect amount. For example, if you were told to pay an uh, incorrect amount and you are enrolled in the QMB program and you're billed by your provider, also those on the QMB program have limited income and assets and they are protected under federal law from being billed by providers for any Medicare cost sharing. We'll go to the next slide. You can, to file a grievance, you, uh, you are involuntarily disenrolled from your plan, and some plans have done this. Uh, there are changes in your premium from your plan or cost sharing, or you experience potential, potential marketing violations or enrollment fraud, and that can happen. So we'll go to the next one to follow a a grievance, uh, you can send a letter to your plan, but you can file a grievance with your plan over the phone, but it's best to send your complaints in writing. Be sure to send your grievance to your plan within 60 days of the event that happened that led to the grievance. Your plan must uh, contact you uh, your plan must get back to you within the 30 days. This is very important. If you made your grievance in writing, then the plan must respond to you in writing. If you made your request over the phone, your plan may respond verbally or in writing unless you specifically requested that the response be in writing. If your request is urgent and your plan must get back to you within 24 hours, if you have not heard back from your plan within this time, you can check the status of your grievance by calling the Medicare number or we can help you at the office, uh, at the SHIP office, help you understand how and when to submit a grievance. So it's very important that you 
uh, make that grievance in writing. And if you call, if you want them to respond to you in writing or verbally. So that's really important how they respond. We'll go to the next slide. So we're talking about complaints. Complaints stem from minor issues that can be typically resolved by staff present at the time the concern is voiced. So some of the five common complaints, uh, we, and we've all done this, but we probably haven't taken action. The long waits, long wait times, I should say. Issues with staff members, amount of time spent with the doctor, oh, maybe seven, 11 minutes you're with your doctor, insurance and billing, the lack of communication and staff being dismissive, or they're not hearing your complaint. Um, as a caregiver, I have gone into the office and I, you know, it's, it's difficult as it is to get to the doctor's office sometimes with the, with the, uh, with my husband, but uh, getting there and having him sit for, you know, our appointment is at 2.30 and we don't see the doctor until 3.30. That, that's hard on him and that's hard on me. And, um, and that's one of the things I do complain about is why is it taking so long if our appointment is at that time? But it has never been resolved. So how to file a complaint. When should you file a complaint? The complaint tracking module, and we'll talk about this in this slide, is in some cases, if you, if you have an issue with a Medicare Advantage or Part D that has not been resolved through the grievance process, grievance process, if you want to make Medicare aware of other issues, you can file a complaint using the complaint tracking module, which is the CTM. And this module, is within the health plan management system and it is in the centers for medicare and medicaid services it's the central repository for complaints uh, received from various uh, cms sources and but not i'm sorry and including but not limited limited to 1-800 medicare calls or uh, from the call center and other regional offices We'll go to the next slide. And I like that little graphic that's just at your wit's end. How uh, you can call Medicare to make a formal complaint in order to escalate an issue with issue to Medicare's attention. But Medicare uh, is an important part. Medicare scores how well plans perform in several categories, including quality of care, customer service, ranging from ratings range from one star to five star. And I'm sure we've all seen that on the Medicare.gov website, there are star ratings. And so these complaints affect those star ratings and uh, five stars being the best and uh, one star being the lowest. And that can make an important point when you're choosing a Medicare plan, uh, the complaints they have to Medicare about that plan. If with a private play pay, it's a way to make sure that uh, the plan is held accountable for their mistakes or bad behavior. And then just looking at the slide, your state may have other ways for you to file a complaint through the consumer or patient protection sections within the attorney general's office. And also there is the board of nursing or nursing board that you can file a complaint with. We'll go to the next slide. And so some of the examples of complaints, um, complaints about durable medical equipment or the supplier, the supplier, I'm sorry. Suppliers have a process in which to handle complaints and the durable medical equipment supplier uh, within the five days you need to contact them. If you have a complaint, contact your, uh, your supplier and tell them what the complaint is. Within five calendar days, your supplier must let you know they received your complaint and they are investigating it. 
Within 14 calendar days, the supplier should send you the results of the investigation in writing. If your supplier does not handle the complaint appropriately or does not respond in time, you can also file a complaint with the Medicare through the 1-800-MEDICARE number. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, and these happen often too, the complaints about my dialysis or kidney transplant center. Um, in stage renal disease network is made up of the Medicare approved re, uh, in stage renal disease facilities in a geographic area. And in cases when your complaint is referred related to complaints of abuse, unsafe conditions or poor quality of care, you may want to file a complaint with your state survey agency. We'll go to the next slide. Your facility is not providing you with medication or helping you access a medication that they are responsible for providing to you. You made complaints to your facility and they were not addressed. If you have these types of concerns, you can raise them with to your facility by requesting a patient care meeting or following your facility's formal complaint process. You can also contact your in-stage renal disease network office to start the network grievance process. We'll go to the next one. Handling complaints. Um, there's the confidential consultation, the immediate advocacy, the quality of care review, and referral. So the confidential consultant, consultant cons consultation, sorry, is to have a conversation with someone at the network or the facility. Immediate advocacy is a way for you uh, to inform the end stage renal disease network to work with you and your facility to resolve an issue. Immediate advocacy must be completed in seven days. And a quality of care review is a larger scale review of if you feel that your concerns involve poor care to you or other patients. This review might include a review of the medical records and can take up to 60 days. Referrals in some cases, your network might identify another agency that can help you resolve your issue. In this case, the network should provide you with the contact information, with the contact information of that organization. So you have several steps you can go through, the confidential consultation, immediate advocacy, and the quality of care review, and then a referral. So we'll go to the next slide. And here we have our resources. Um, the Quality Improvement Organization, there's the email there. The State Health Insurance Assistance Program, which is us, SHIP, you can call. The Senior Medicare Patrol and the Social Security Administration. And those, uh, I'm sure we'll make those available to those who want that, if you would put that in the chat. We're glad to get that information to you. And other resources, 1-800-MEDICARE, your local Department of Social Services or the Health and Human Services, Long-Term Care Ombudsman, Health Insurance Marketplace if you're not eligible for Medicare. And and we just uh, put here some case studies. So um, Richie recently had a hospital stay that was covered by Medicare, by his uh, Medicare Advantage plan. He felt that there were some problems with the quality of care he received. He didn't think the hospital staff checked on him often enough. And he thinks that this might have gotten in the way of his recovery. He already reported the hospital to the state's Department of Health, but wants to know if there are other steps that he can take to hold the hospital accountable. Well, what should Richie do?
Richie should call SHIP or go to shiphelp.org and SHIP will explain how to report a complaint to his plan and they should respond to his grievance within 30 days. He should be prepared to provide more information about his complaint. And it's the good idea always, always to write, write it down. And here's another case study. Josephina got a Medicare summary notice and Angel's going to talk more about that, showing that a doctor submitted several claims to Medicare for services she received the previous month. She is confused because she only saw the provider once, but her MSN lists three different dates of service. She's concerned that this is an incorrect, this is incorrect information or an error that might affect her plan covering, her plan covering service, services that she might need in the future. And Josephina is very correct. She should be concerned um, that she might be denied services in the future if they have already paid, if Medicare has already paid for that. So Josephina, what should she do? Josephina should contact the provider to let them know about the errors that she found on her Medi Medicare summary notice and ask them to clarify and or correct it. She is, can call the Senior Medicare Patrol if the, prov if the provider is un unresponsive or un is unwilling, which some are, not all, there's some great providers out there, but sometimes, and this may be a potential fraud and the SMP can assist with reporting to the proper sources. The SMP can remind Josephina to continue tracking her healthcare appointments by checking her Medicare statements and billing. Um, her, her statements and bills against the calendar, her calendar on her My Healthcare Tracker for her for her appointments. If Josephina suspects fraud, errors, or abuse, the part of her uh, on her on the part of her providers, she can call the SNP uh, again. So again, this is uh, Felicia. I'm Felicia with the Area Agency on Aging and so thankful that you are here after the uh, Easter holiday. And um, if you have any questions, please put those in the chat and we'll try to respond to each one of those. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you, Felicia. Thank you so very much. Um, Angel, we're gonna turn it over to you. Um, Angel's um, with the... Um, Better Business Bureau Education Foundation out of Houston. And we're gonna turn it over to you and let you take, take it from here. All right, awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you, Felicia, for that awesome information. Um, so yes, today we are going to be going over how to read your Medicare summary notices. Do I have control of this? Am I? There we go. Okay, so first let's go, ha go ahead and start off with who we are. So I am with the Better Business Bureau's Education Foundation, um, and I am with a program in the Better Business Bureau's Education Foundation called the Senior Medicare Patrol. And Felicia did mention this a little bit earlier, but I'll go ahead and do a little deep dive into it. So what we are is we are a federally funded program. Um, there is one of us in every single state, and so we are specific to Texas, but um, there's also one in all of the U.S. territories, so the U.S. Virgin Island, Islands, Guam, Puerto Rico, same thing that Felicia was mentioning earlier. So what we do here is we recruit and train volunteers and professionals about Medicare fraud and abuse so that they can share that information and better inform the community about what to do if you see something like Medicare fraud. Um, and then we also report intentional fraud and abuse to Medicare fraud control units. So, of course, we send that information to Medicare, um, but also it's not just Medicare that deals with fraud because fraud is a crime. Um, so we can send it to um, local law enforcement, the FBI, the Attorney General, Office of Inspector General. It just depends on the type of fraud and the size fit that we're seeing and also where we're seeing it. So this is our mission here. 
So our mission is to empower and assist Medicare beneficiaries, their families, and caregivers to prevent, detect, and report healthcare fraud, error, and abuse through outreach, counseling, and education. Um, so go ahead and say that five times fast. <laughs> But what it is, is we just go out and we educate the community about Medicare fraud um, so that you can be better prepared to handle um, any sort of issues that arise. So what are we actually doing here? Um, why does this matter? What is the point of all of this? Um, so actually, Medicare loses billions of dollars every year to fraud, error, and abuse. And so that's an estimated 60 billion dollars in loss every single year. So that is a lot of money that is going out of the Medicare system every single year. Um, and so approximately 250,000 beneficiaries have their Medicare numbers compromised. So their medical identity is stolen um, and it's being used fraudulently. So what we ask is that you follow some of these steps to help us prevent Medicare fraud because that $60 billion is coming out of our talk pockets, right, as taxpayers. And if you are a Medicare beneficiary, that's negatively affecting you as well because that's raising your premiums, um, it's affecting the cost of your health care, um, there's less money in the system, and also it can cause the system to be super unstable because that is $60 billion being lost every single year. Um, and so it reduces the longevity of the program. So maybe you're not on Medicare yet. Maybe you're going to be on in 10 years, five years, or maybe you want your kids, your grandkids to benefit from a system like that. Um, so we really want to reduce the amount of waste that is being lost every year or else that system is not going to stick around um, because it's just not affordable. Okay, and so these are the kind of steps that we're asking you to do um, to help stop Medicare fraud. So we ask that you prevent, detect, and report. It's easy, three steps that we want you to do. And so prevention, of course, the easiest way to handle Medicare fraud is to stop it from happening in the first place. Um, so we ask that you know what scams to look out for. We want you to educate yourself, know what's out there so that you don't become a victim of it. Okay, so just be educated on the new things that are coming up. And we have all sorts of information online. I'm sure Felicia and Melinda also has a wealth of information about these. Um, and also ask that you don't answer any calls from unknown numbers, anything that's not saved in your phone, in your own contact list. Let it go to voicemail. Real people leave voicemails, scammers don't, okay? Um, we also ask that next, detect. So track your healthcare visits. Um, make sure you know what services were actually received, what doctors you saw, um, <laughs> excuse me, what doctors you saw, what date it was, so that whenever you get your Medicare summary notice, you can cross-check it with your own records to see, hey, I didn't receive that service, or hey, I didn't see that doctor that day. What is this? So that you can actually see um, there could be potential fraud, and then you're able to report it, okay? And so that gets us to step three, reporting healthcare fraud. So we ask that you report any sort of suspected fraud or abuse to your healthcare provider. So just calling up your doctor saying, hey, Dr. Jones, I'm seeing something kind of weird. Um, and it might just be an accident. It can be easily fixed. Or if they're a little resistant, they're not helping, um, go ahead, call your insurance provider, gather your information, and then call the um, Texas Senior Medicare Patrol. And go ahead, let us know what's going on so we can help build your case, gather information with you, and send it where it needs to go. So today, we are focusing on that detect aspect, so that number two. So what we're going to be doing today is understanding how to read a Medicare summary notice, um, ability to detect potential fraud, error, and abuse in that Medicare summary notice, and then also um, give you the ability to use um, a senior Medicare patrol's healthcare tracker as a healthcare tool, and we'll get into that. All right, so Medicare summary notices. Um, if you're not familiar with it, this is kind of what it looks like. This is your first page, um, and this can be really beneficial if you're on Medicare, um, if you're a caregiver, if you're a social worker, um, if you're dealing with any sort of person who is on Medicare so that you're able to just kind of decipher what's going on um, and help walk them through it because it can be a little bit tricky. So let's go ahead and do a deep dive onto page one. 
So page one, this is your dashboard. The first thing you're going to look at, look at that top of the page. Make sure that you have the official um, logo at the top for the, <laughs> excuse me, for the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, <laughs> excuse me. It's also going to have the title of your Medicare summary notice for the plan that you're in. So this example here, Medicare summary notice for part B. Okay. Next, go ahead, um, further down, it's going to say notice for insert your name. So it'll say notice for Angel Hansen. Um, Make sure that it is your name. It'll have your Medicare number, the last four digits of it. Make sure that that's accurate. Um, they're not going to have your full Medicare number on it. Um, it's just going to be the last four digits. It's going to tell you the date that it was sent out, and then it's what um, claims it's going to cover. So between, for this example, for June to September. Next, um, the next little section is going to be your deductible status. So it's just going to give you a little bit of information about your deductible. So how much money you're going to have to pay up to until um, your Medicare plan is really going to kick in and start covering all of your, um, covering that 80% um, of your Medicare costs. So for here, um, this is saying for this person for, in particular, their Part B deductible deductible, they've met $85 of the 162 deductible. So they still have a little ways to go. And it'll also say in bold capital letters, this is not a bill. Okay. Um, so please know that this is not billing you for anything. It's no, it's not an official charge. You don't have to send any money back. It's just a summary. It's just to let you know what claims have been processed in these past three months um, and just letting you know so you can review it. Okay. Um, people see this a lot of times and they actually think, oh, well, it's not a bill, so I can just throw it away. Please do not throw it away. Your Medicare summary notice is the number one way for you to know if there's any fraud, if your Medicare number is being misused. So please keep it, review it. Um, we ask that you keep it for a few months at a time, um, up to about a year, um, just so that you know, like you can look back later and say, hey, like actually that is kind of weird. So please do not throw these away. And then finally, it'll have like a little summary of your claims and costs. Um, so it's going to show any facilities or providers that you went to just in a little list format um, in that three month period. And so check, make sure that those are all accurate. Um, it also tells you this is a total amount that you may be billed. OK, once again, it's not a bill. This is no confirmation. This is just um, a little summary, a quick addition of like, this is what could be charged to you if such and such. So don't freak out. Okay, page two. So this is kind of just like a information page. Making the most of your Medicare. Um, it's going to show you, it's going to have a quick little thing of how to check this notice. What are you actually looking for? Um, it's also going to have a section about how to report fraud. So it has the 1-800-MEDICARE number on it. Um, it might have some fraud examples and some quick facts. Um, and also has like an FAQ section um, as well as these are helpful numbers that you can call if you need assistance. Um, it also has any alerts or messages from Medicare. So over here on this right hand side, it's saying, hey, make sure to go get your Medicare preventative services done. Um, go get your um, pneumatical shot, <laughs> um, how to change your address, just some important information from Medicare. All right, page three. So this is kind of the nitty gritty of the Medicare summary notices. So this is your claims page. Um, so it shows the details from that list that we saw on page one, where it just showed the providers and kind of the claims. This goes um, a little bit deeper into it. So it's going to have at the top, it gives you definitions for each of the, of the columns. Um, and then down at the bottom, it'll actually have the actual detailed claim. So it'll start with um, going left to right. It has the service provided and the billing code. So it's just going to tell you what it actually is and what the code that it was charged as. So it just gives a little description. Um, next column is 
service approved by Medicare, okay? Is Medicare covering this service? Yes or no? Very straightforward. Um, your Medicare, the amount provider charged, okay? Next. So that's the amount that they charge as a base. So that's what they normally charge, but this is not necessarily the amount that they are charging you. This is their regular flat fee rate. We get next to the next column, Medicare approved amount. So this is the amount that they have a deal with Medicare. And so that's the maximum amount that they are allowed to charge to a Medicare beneficiary. Okay, so this is the deal that they have made. So that's actually the number that you would be dealing with. Okay, that $45 is just for your information. And that $28.54 is what they're actually allowed to charge for a Medicare beneficiary. Okay, that next column, we have the actual amount that Medicare paid out. Okay, this is typically 80% of the approved amount. Okay, so that Medicare approved amount, we're gonna do 80%. That's what Medicare is gonna cover. And so this is the amount that they actually paid. And so then that next section maximum you may be billed, not that you are being billed, um, is that final 20%. So whatever is left over um, from that Medicare approved amount minus um, the amount that Medicare actually paid. So if you have like a supplemental insurance, some Medigap, something like that, um, it might cover this, that extra 20%, some or all of it, okay? So a little bit um, further into it, this is that same section, just a little bit more information. So here at the top, it's gonna tell you, this is the date that this service was provided. So for this specific claim, um, it's gonna be on June 18th, 2011. Okay, it's going to tell you your provider, who you actually saw that day, and their phone number. So in this case, we saw Dr. Jane Doe. Okay, um, it's going to say the name and address of the facility. So we went to physical therapy at Main Street, any town, any state. Okay, so this is where you're going to be looking and say, hey, did I actually go and see Dr. Jane on June 18th, 2011? And you might say, okay, well, I did go to the doctor on June 18th, but I didn't go to see Dr. Jane. Okay, make note of that. You can just contact your provider and say, hey, I see that it actually says Dr. Jones, but whenever I saw Dr. Jane or vice versa, and they can say, oh, you know, well, Dr. Jane is the attending and Dr. Jones is working under her or something like that. So that might just be um, a technicality. It might not be um, those red flags that are raising up that might not actually be fraud. So that's just something to look into. Okay, and then it'll have your service provided. It's going to have that just described a little bit. It might be a little bit confusing depending on how they code it and the way that they kind of use their technical medical jargon. Um, but it'll just give you a little description of what you're actually being charged for. And it has the amounts charged and the totals of the claim at the bottom. So if you're charged for multiple services, if you went on June 18th to Dr. Jane and she provided therapeutic exercise as well as some blood tests um, and, and she was checking, she gave you a strep throat test, okay, then you would have multiple claims under it. And so it would have a larger total at the bottom. Um, but this is just for one service that was actually provided. Okay. Oops, excuse me. So then, um, so you might have multiple pages of that last one. I'll go ahead and go back. So if that page three, it might be multiple pages. It might be one, two, three, four pages, depending on how many doctors you saw, how many services were provided to you in that three month period. Or it might be super short. It might just be one little section from Dr. Jane on June 18th. Okay, um, so it just depends on your healthcare habits and what you actually need and require. Okay, and so then on your last page of your Medicare summary notice, it's going to be how to handle denied claims or to file an appeal. So this is an information page. Um, so it's, um, it's just going to tell you if your claim is denied for any reason, go ahead, call your provider, make sure they sent in the right information. Um, if they didn't send in the right information, ask them to go ahead and correct that error. If they're not doing it in a timely fashion, you can go ahead and what Ms. Felicia was telling us earlier, you can go ahead and report that. 
um, you can also go ahead and call 1-800-MEDICARE. Say, hey, uh, my claim was denied. My, um, my provider sent in all the right information. What's going on here? Um, so you can appeal. You can appeal. If they deny it, you can go ahead. You have 120 days okay, from the day that you got your Medicare summary notice to go ahead and file, and file your appeal. So you're going to go ahead. What you're going to do, go through your Medicare summary notice, whichever one, if it says, no, the service was not approved, it is not covered by Medicare, and you disagree, circle it. Go ahead and circle it. You can highlight it, circle it, um, explain in writing why you disagree with this decision. You can just write it on your Medicare summary notice. You can write it right there. You can add in an extra page. Um, and then go ahead and fill in this section over on the right, your name. So I'd put Angel Hansick, I'd sign it, I'd put my phone number, my Medicare number. Um, I'd add any additional information. I'd say this is covered because X, Y, Z, I haven't received my um, yearly checkup, my wellness, whatever it is. So this should be covered. And then you'll go ahead and mail it to the address that's on the bottom. So depending on where you are, what state you're in, um, what region, it'll be a different address. So go ahead and just mail it to that address. Alrighty. Okay, so how do I check that my dates, providers, and facilities are actually correct? It has all this information on it. It says that I went there, but that was three, four months ago. I haven't checked my Medicare summary notice in a while. I go to a bunch of doctors. How am I supposed to know that all of these are correct? I don't remember. So that's where, um, that's where we ask you to document. So write this down. Write down the visits that you have with your providers, the date, the provider name, what services were provided, where did you go, okay? And then once you have all this information, it makes it so much easier to look at your Medicare summary notice and say, hey, that's weird, that, that seems a bit fraudulent. I didn't see that doctor on that day, okay? And so this can be a little bit overwhelming, right? This is a lot to keep track of. That's a lot of loose papers or sticky notes in your purse. I do that all the time. Um, and so what we actually provide is a healthcare tracker. We provide that through Senior Medicare Patrol. It looks like this. It is a, uh, it's about full fold size. And what it has in it um, is just, it's a tool for, for tracking your medical services. So um, it's a personal journal um, to write down everything. It's, it's a way for you to easily have reference. Okay. So it'll look like this on the inside where you can write the date, the provider, the reason for your visit, what tests were received, what actually happened, how long you were there, and any extra notes that you need, a little handy dandy notes section saying, oh, I need to come back on this date, or the doctor said these things, and I need to make sure that I, um, I check my medicine when I get back, whatever it is. Um, so it's just all together, it has multiple pages, so then you can keep track of it, and it's all in one spot. Okay, so whenever you receive your Medicare summary notice, go ahead, take some time, take 30 minutes, sit down, um, sit down with your mom if you're a caretaker, um, or sit down with a friend, or sit down by yourself and just and compare. Go through, and so here, I wrote in my journal that I saw Dr. Jane um, for physical therapy on June 18th. Um, I was there for about 30 minutes. Um, and I have another appointment on August 15th. That's just my little note. And so I get to go back and I look, and yes, all of this information matches. Great. So now I go ahead, I check it up in the right-hand corner. And so now I know I've already, um, I've already have a claim for this. Okay, this has already been sent in, it's already been processed, and it's good. I don't have to worry about this appointment anymore. Um, that way, you know, if you get another Medicare summary notice, um, the next round, and it says, hey, on June 18th, Jane Doe, um, hey, no, I already got that. So now you know it's a little fishy. So what are you actually looking for? So make sure you're looking for duplicate charges, being charged twice for the same visit, test, equipment, prescription, any sort of double billing, any charges for services that were not received or not ordered by your doctor, or upcoding. 
So whenever you're, um, whenever they code in something that's more expensive than what you actually received. If you suspect any fraud or abuse, if you're seeing anything weird on your Medicare summary notices, if it's not matching what is in your healthcare tracker, contact your healthcare provider. Say, hey, what's going on here? This is looking a little weird. You can contact your insurance provider and say, hey, what's going on here? Um, and call your Texas Senior Medicare Patrol. We are here to assist you. Um, we are professionals. It's completely toll free. It's confidential. Um, we're federally funded, so this is all already paid for by your tax dollars. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, but we are able to, to navigate you through that kind of messy field of, of Medicare fraud. Um, here is the hotline information. That's 888-341-6187, um, as well as my name and my information. I'm the outreach specialist at the Texas Senior Medicare Patrol. Um, I do presentations like this all the time. I go out and I do workshops for social workers, for caregivers, for Medicare beneficiaries, for anyone who is working um, around or adjacent to Medicare. I am there to assist and I have all sorts of different presentations. Um, and I am happy to, to share that with anyone who is interested in my list of presentations. And now I'll go ahead and open the floor for questions. Before we get to questions, just because this works um, better when, when, since we're recording it, I'm going to play it this afternoon. Can we move to the next slide and go over CEUs first? And then we'll, oh, we'll yeah, go to questions course. if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you joining us um, for CEUs or looking for a certificate of attendance, um, his, these are the guidelines, and the guidelines are the same for both. But um, please understand that for CEUs, we are set up to provide them for social workers and LPCs in the state of Texas that are licensed in Texas. Um, if you have a different license in Texas, or you would like to, um, or you're outside of Texas, and you'd like to go ahead and get a, a certificate, you're more than welcome to do so and submit it to your to your jurisdiction, just just know that um, that these are who we're set up with. So they, it's you know, it's up to them whether they're going to whether they take it or not. And there's nothing that we can do about that. The certificates of attendance are also available. The guidelines are, are the same for both. Uh, today's sim, uh, webinar is worth one and a half hour CEUs credit. You must have completed the entire live webinar to um, to qualify. And I'm going to make a note here, and I made this uh, last week. Please, when people send me questions right after the webinar and they send me an email saying, um, I attended the webinar, how do I get my CEUs? That's a very that's very suspicious when you're required to complete the entire webinar and we go over this twice um, in the webinar and we do that. So please, so please understand that, um, that um, Please understand, we're looking for, if you're a professional, you're required to be on these to get the CUs. If you're looking for CUs, you should have that information or, or refer back to the slides to get them. Um, so um, you must also complete the Google survey. The Google survey, you should um, get an option as you close out today to access the Google survey. Um, but if you have a pop-up blocker in your computer, sometimes that doesn't work. Uh, the survey link will also be emailed out to you in a follow-up email that should go out tomorrow. Um, and, and once you receive that, you'll have the link uh, both to the slides, if you don't already have that, and to the um, to the evaluation. Um, the Google evaluation form will be good uh, until 5 p.m. one week from today. And, and give me about three weeks after that to, um, to get the certificates out to everyone. So... Um, um, Felicia and, and, and Angel, I'm going to, well, okay, first of all, I guess next month we're going to talk about the Medicare Savings Program and durable medical equipment scams um, for May. I'm going to note that just so you know, June, we will not be having a Medicare Monday, but Medicare Monday in May will be on the 8th. So I'm going to turn it over to you guys to answer any questions. Okay, I did see a couple questions about how to get a healthcare tracker. Um, and so you can just reach out to me. Um, you can send me an email, you can give me a call and I'll get your information and I can send them out um, to individuals. I can mail it um, just one or two to um, a beneficiary or if you work with the group or if you um, 
live uh, or if you work at assisted living or anything like that, I can ship you multiple to hand out to residents. Um, so whatever you need, and we have them in multiple languages, English, Spanish, um, Chinese, Korean, Vietnamese, all sorts of different languages. And also if you have specific language requests, you can let me know and we can look into getting that language as well. I will include Angel's email in the follow-up email as well. You got it on the slide, I believe, but I'll also have that on the follow in the follow-up email. I saw Felicia had answered one um, in the chat. Anybody else? Yes, um, there was one. I'm not sure. How does the doctor determine the time length of visit? There are times the doctor steps out of the office and patient is waiting in the patient room? That's a very good question. Um, yeah. I, <laughs> I'm not aware if there is a specific time for doctors to meet with individuals. Um, we will definitely have to take that back um, mm -hmm. and check on that because I, I don't know if there is a minimum time. There may be a minimum of time for a client to be in the office. So that could be the nurse visit as well as the doctor visit. Um, but as far as how much time a doctor has to spend with a client, I have not seen anything about that, but we can definitely check on that. I have been in those situations where I've had to sit in the patient room for a while. And you know, right. the, the, as the doctors come in, you know, they have no idea a lot of times what they're actually going to see in the day. And and you don't know what, that they haven't hit, hit a crisis with someone and they've got to deal with it. And and that's just the way it goes in their field. And so, mm -hmm. um, so sometimes it just requires a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. And, um, with things like physical therapy, um, and so when it were the healthcare journal, you know, has, I was there for 10, 30 50 minutes, um, physical therapy is a little bit more specific with, you know, they need to be working with you for that whole 30 minutes, you know, for you to be charged for 30 minutes kind of thing. You know, if they show up and they leave the room for 20 minutes and come back in at the last 10 and say, oh yeah, we did 30 minutes of physical therapy together. Well, that's kind of sketchy. Um, but I hope that that answers, um, I hope that answers your question. So if you're not receiving, you know, 30 minutes of care and you're being charged for 30 minutes, you know, when they're supposed to be working with you, doing stretches or exercises, um, that's something that needs to be called and spoken about. Um, she, she, right. she, it, she clarified that um, mm -hmm. in the chat. And, and the other question is, okay, is does that include doctor time as well as the nurse time? You know, is that all? you know, does the nurse do 15 minutes and the doctor does 15 minutes? Does that count as a 30 minute doctor visit? Mm -hmm. And I don't know the specifics on yeah. that exactly. Yeah. For billing yeah. purposes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I'll, we'll try to find that out um, before Marty sends out the follow-up and then get that to him so it can be included with the follow-up. The other thing that I know happens with, with and again, in my experience, you know, when you're in there, it really depends, a lot of it depends on what you're in there for, because a lot of times you may be going in there for something and and, and they may have the nurse um, hook you up to the heart monitor to see how your heart's, you know, uh, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you come in and you say that, the doctor may walk out right away and tell the nurse, we need to get an EKG or whatever you call it on them. So it's just mm -hmm. so much, so much of that depends on what you're going in and needing done. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah, it could depend on the billing code that's used um, when it's billed would determine the amount of time also. And I'm sure the coding and all that goes into how Medicare comes up with their costs. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so difficult to fraud. In some cases, it's it's just not black and white. And, you know, mm -hmm. some people push the, push the envelope all the time and get away with it. And and some people follow the rules. It's just the way it works. I think <laughs> it's life. Right, right, right. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, yeah. It is mm -hmm. just so complex. Right. Right. Any yeah. Qu so anybody else have any questions or any comments? We're gonna um, we're gonna wrap it up unless somebody else has something they want to add. Do you guys have anything you want to add? 
Well, I think Felicia and Angel, you both did a great job and mm -hmm. you kind of complimented one another with the information that you had. Mm -hmm. Felicia ended with the um, example with the Medicare, uh, um, the uh, fraud issue. Mm -hmm. And then Angel came in and talked about fraud. So that worked perfect. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank yeah, you. Thank both. you, Marty. Thank you, Melinda. Thank you for, um, for the partnership. We certainly appreciate it. Um, Y'all, thank you all for joining us. We certainly appreciate it. 